Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théâtres, des photos de bord de mer, dans mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, dans mon jardin d'hiver. Epidemiologists are continuing to track the spread of coronavirus. We now have first confirmed cases of the virus in places like Brazil, Norway, Greece, Pakistan, and Georgia. Now, in many of these cases, we can identify how a person got the virus, what their source of exposure was. The other way to think about this is something called community spread. Now, that is when cases start appearing without a known source of exposure. So in Brazil, for example, uh, the person who tested positive had just been in Italy, where there's a lot of the virus. In Norway, the person had just returned from China. But in some countries, they already have community spread. That includes Hong Kong, Italy, Iran, Singapore, South Korea, Taiwan, Taiwan, and Thailand. So that means people are showing up with the virus, and it is not clear how they got it. Well, tonight we have what appears to be the first case of community spread here in the United States, in Northern California. The origins of this case is unknown. Yesterday, the CDC said that this was likely to happen. They also emphasized that people should not panic. Here to explain the trajectory of this virus, Dr. Peter Hotez, the dean for the National School of Tropical Medicine at the Baylor College of Medicine, who back in 2014 explained to us how the Ebola virus works and how to balance fear and reason surrounding that outbreak when we took the uh, subway. Um, so, doctor, let's start with this, the, the, the news about community spread. Um, the CDC essentially is saying this was inevitable. What, what does it mean if there's a case in the U.S. that doesn't have any known links to any of the, the sort of main countries? Well, you know, first of all, thanks for having me back. You know, what we have seen now is that there's transmission in multiple countries, the countries that you mentioned, including Italy and Iran. And now we may have to add the United States to that list. You know, the World Health Organization is not officially calling this a pandemic yet, but we seem to be uh, inching in that direction. And, and the concern is that we're going to start seeing a uh, foothold that this virus gains in the United States. And the evidence for that is person to person uh, ongoing transmission. You know, the president tonight uh, tried to emphasize the few, the small numbers of, of 15, but that's that's not the point. The point is we know these numbers are going to go up. We are going to start seeing human to human transmission and we really have to get ready for this and, and protect our two most vulnerable populations. Which are? Well, number one are the healthcare workers. Uh, we saw in Wuhan in central China how there were more than a thousand healthcare workers affected. There were six deaths. You can imagine what would happen in the United States if we saw uh, an epidemic among our healthcare providers that would cause a lot of concern and panic. So we absolutely need to protect them by providing the PPE, the personal uh, protective equipment uh, that they need. We also need a better diagnostic and, and making it more accessible. That's a huge problem because we're learning about this virus that many people don't present with classic respiratory sy symptoms. We saw in China, sometimes they present with abdominal symptoms. They were mistakenly put on the surgical ward. Uh, that will happen in the United States uh, without a good diagnostic test that's rapidly accessible. Uh, we've seen epidemics in hospitals. So getting that diagnostic test other than the PPE is, is a big priority. The second, of course, is our older population because we've seen the higher mortality rates among those over the age of 60 and those with underlying chronic conditions. 
conditions such as diabetes or, or hypertension. So we will see an increase in numbers. The big question is, are we going to be looking at small uh, uh, community level transmissions in, in a few co- uh, cities across the country, or are we going to be looking at something much larger? This is a new virus agent. We have absolutely no way of predicting. So the the prudent thing, is, as the CDC talked about yesterday, is to anticipate the worst and hope for the best. So when you say it's a new virus agent, what are the what do we know about this uh, this virus, and what are the variables that will determine uh, just just how far it spreads? Well, you know, we've seen some early numbers coming out of China suggesting that it's a pretty highly transmissible virus. So let me give you an example. Seasonal flu has a number assigned to it called one point, a, num- a, a number called the reproductive number 1.3. That means if a single person gets flu, on average, 1.3 other individuals will get it. It's transmissible, uh, but not nearly among the most transmissible agents we know about. For this one, the numbers go as high as 3.58, up to up to four. Uh, and so huh. that means it's a very highly transmissible virus. We're also hearing different stories about the case fatality rate. Uh, initially, numbers coming out of China said 2%, and others began dismissing that number, saying, well, that doesn't really account for the number of people with low-grade symptoms or have no symptoms at all. But yesterday, uh, Bruce Elward from the World Health Organization uh, gave us some very concerning news that, yes, indeed, that 2% number uh, case fatality rate looks real. And and, and if that's the case, uh, that that's of, of great concern because, you know, flu, which is a bad illness. And as the president learned about flu tonight, uh, today, that it can kill up to 40 mil, 40,000 Americans, 60,000 Americans, a case fatality rate of 2% is 10 to 20 times higher than flu. So this, so I think, you know, it's a, it's a, it's an art, right, to convey bad news without, without spreading panic. Um, this is a serious virus infection and, and it's going to take all hands on deck to do this. Uh, I know uh, the president did the right thing in the sense of trying to find someone to oversee uh, operations, recognizing that this goes beyond the health sector. Look, when we had to combat Ebola, we actually said, had to send in the 101st Airborne Division. Uh, we needed the U.S. military uh, to help us. So we ha- he, he's right to anticipate that we're going to have to go across multiple agencies, possibly including the U.S. military. Whether Vice President Pence is, is actually going to devote his full time to this, you know, when Ron Klain was doing this uh, during Ebola in the Obama administration, you know, it was 24-7 yeah. uh, for him and, and his staff. And, and so I don't know how committed the vice president's going to be re- to really taking this on. It is Thursday, the 27th of February of 2020. And you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam, and our daily special is Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. A little bit of jambalaya, a little bit of spice in your life. Oh, my. Well, speaking of spice, you know, there's Mardi Gras going on in Brazil right now, and everybody's afraid of that coronavirus getting here. Guess what? It's already here. And uh, Trump fired the whole pandemic response team in 2018 supposedly to save money. Now, if that money didn't actually go into his own pockets, which I think he's capable of because whatever, uh, according to a little known OLC memo, whatever the president does when he does it is in the uh, advancement of he being the president. So if he raised the treasury and actually pockets actual funds that he's supposedly saving... Who's to say that that's wrong? (laughs) Exactly. Or he put those monies towards his stupid wall. Better to have people die of a pandemic than uh, take money away from his wall. Of course, it still goes along with the ongoing meme, and I know you've heard this before. Property is always more valuable when delivered vacant to a hostile foreign power. What better way to achieve that than with a pandemic? So, uh, I think Trump's task is to somehow knock our GDP down to the size of Italy so that Vlad can better compete with us, because that's about where he's at. Boy, talk about making America great again. I don't know for who. Well, I have my suspicions. I'm being rhetorical. You know what I'm doing. 
So uh, that border wall, they're going through uh, Arizona and parts of the southwest where the Seguro cacti are and in our a heritage cultural site. You can get five years in jail for destroying or even, you know, semi-destroying a Seguro cacti, cactus. Five, five years. I'd put him in hard labor, but, uh, you know, we do live in a representative democracy. You don't want my arbitrary decisions uh, to impact the, the lives of mere mortals, even though my name is Royal Justice. Regardless, um, five years you can get in some cases, and sometimes more. And work crews are just destroying the hell out of Seguro Cactus. I just saw some pictures of, of some Seguro uh, stacked up, and I got to tell you, it <laughs> it looked like uh, one of those pits where they throw the bodies in of the people they don't want anyone to know that they've you know done. That's what it looked like to me. Ugh. Boy, and uh, apparently there's no one to stop them because of that little known OLC memo that whatever the president does, well. Whatever a Republican president who happens to be mobbed up with the Russians, because I don't think this applies to anybody else. Certainly not the black guy. Yeah, where were the secret OLC memos that gave him some Article Two powers to do whatever he wanted to do when he wanted to do it and screw everybody else? I think there's two levels of OLC memos here. Let's be clear. And let's get back to this whole coronavirus fiasco. Let's be clear. You know, Trump is a germaphobe, but I don't really think he cares or thinks about other people getting sick only if they get him sick. So if he's washing his hands and he's keeping people from hugging him, spitting in my ear, he wanted to kiss me. What's up? What's wrong with that guy? Everybody wants to kiss him. Yeah, like you're a mob boss. If someone kisses your ring, go wash your hands. That's what his dad taught him, and they and he does. But uh, you know, firing or getting rid of the whole pandemic response team to supposedly save money—no, of course we know it's going to the wall. But that unhinged presser that he gave yesterday. Now, apparently, we're going to get more of those, which is fine. But uh, I. I was watching uh, the CDC and the National Institute of Health guy, Vellucci, is that his name? Vaducci. Uh <laughs> It was all they could do. They had this sort of like loyal smile on their face. I When Trump was just blowing them off, oh yeah, it's not going to be anything. Because, you know, he's worried about the market, worried about a strong dollar. Good for some people, but bad for him. So he thinks that if he doesn't, like, make this coronavirus thing go away, you know, he's not going to make it go away, but maybe the reporting of it will. Uh, It might help him financially. Uh, I don't care how much you wash your hands, buddy. No one can be immune to this, at least right now. (laughs) So we'll see. And what are the anti-vaxxers going to be doing in a year from now when they finally get a vaccine for the coronavirus? I'm not letting my kid get vaccinated. There's little, little, the coronavirus will, the vaccine will turn him into a newt. But he got better. So uh, I, I'm waiting for that. I haven't really heard any of the anti-vaxxers come out just yet while uh, the idea of a vaccine has been floated for the coronavirus. But they'll be there. <laughs> you know they will. So um, Mike Pence, who oversaw a rapid increase in HIV cases because, you know, he wanted to pray away the gay. And instead of doing the prudent thing when you had an opioid crisis along with an HIV crisis, maybe you want to mitigate some of your pray away the gay attitude and do some actual science and some actual, shall we say, democratic, republic, social engineering. Let's get rid of the republic part. Let's go to the representative democracy part. Social engineering. And what is that? Well, when the most uh, conservative, almost Oath Keeper sheriff says, you know what? It's so bad here. Maybe we ought to hand out clean needles to these drug addicts. Better that than have an HIV uh, 
increase. And that's exactly what happened on his watch because he had to pray the gay away. And if you can't pray the gay away, then those gays need to suffer. And if suffering results in death, all the better. Okay. That's the Christian way to do it, apparently, in Pence's head. And he's running this CDC, or not even CDC. He's running this pandemic response. Mike Pence, vice president. I guess, you know, he can do it part time. Does Trump think that Mike Pence is Mulvaney? They should have put Mulvaney in charge. At least he's got some gumption. Jeez. So, um, which makes me think that Mulvaney's on his way out. But Mike Pence, he's the vice president. I think he needs somebody full time in this position. Wouldn't you think? But it's all for show. They don't know how to lead. They can put on a show. Which, let's talk about that just very briefly. That You know, the production values of the, this show sucks. They don't know how to put on a show. They can put on a reality game event. That is not a show. I don't care how many people think The Masked Singer is one of the great theatrical spectacles they've ever seen. It's a spectacle, of course. Theatrical? <laughs> it's a carnival. I wish it was a carnival. At least a carnival has a little bit more uh, symbolic intent to uplift the consciousness. <laughs> okay? I mean, isn't that what theater, art is supposed to do? None of that is theater and art. It's a circus. It's, it, it, I can't even call it a circus. can't even call it a storefront carnival with a hammer ride. Okay. What's on the rest of the menu here? I could just go on and on and on and on. But we do have a curated show. We have some order. It's not all chaos that we have to succumb to. Not all. A little bit, a little slice of order is always good to just, shall we say, achieve a balance. <laughs> on the rest of the menu, well, of course, that was Dr. Peter Hotez as he was explaining the trajectory of the coronavirus and what can and should be done. And yeah, we've got to do a little bit more than just wash our hands. But do keep washing your hands. Don't put your hands to your mouth. Do all the, you know, all the things you would normally do for everything, but even more now. Oh, and one other thing, don't panic. <laughs> Whenever they say don't panic, it's just like in Independence Day where everybody like just goes on a riot. On the rest of the menu, citing government overreach. Boy, this, this article makes my blood boil. They cited government overreach. Three Republicans who voted against the bill that makes lynching a crime. Yeah, we'll speak about those three. And, oh, there's, <laughs> there's a more to the story than that. A little independent action here. Congress warns the Trump administration not to take more money for the border wall. And, you know, you know, Trump is just saying, yeah, right. And a Roger Stone juror clapped back at Trump for denigrating the concept of equal justice. Well, mobsters do that. They don't believe in equal justice. They want their justice meted out. After the break, we move to the chef's table where the United Nations decried a nearly 50% increase in killings of women activists in Colombia. And disgraced former Austrian far-right leader Heinz Christian Strach will again run, this time with an extremist splinter group, as if the group he was with was not already an extremist splinter group. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit.
bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com. To the right of the page is our chat room link, monitored by Kelly Lincoln. Thank you, Kelly. To the leftish of that chat room link that just happens to be at the bottom of our homepage, that just happens to be at netrootsradio.com. You will hopefully locate that Patreon button that will take you to our Patreon site. It's actually a link in the text. So if you could become a recurring Patreon of Netroots Radio, your recurring Patreon midge helps us pay our bills, amass the funds that we need to get newish machinery because these workhorses have been working like horses for quite a while and they do need to be put out to pasture. Not... I mean, just to graze. We're not going to get rid of them. They're still going to do a little bit of tasks, but at a, a much lesser scale than what they're expected to achieve now. So your uh, recurring patronage, as I mentioned, uh, how about the cost of, a, of an espresso-type coffee drink sent once a month to Netroots Radio, and we're able to stretch those dollars on the quantum scale, because we are expert quantum mechanics. Oh, indeed. We have found new particles on the quantum level in which to be able to achieve the ends of stretching these dollars, which we have been doing for going on nine years now. Nine. <laughs> yeah. So your uh, contribution, recurring contribution, helps us achieve our civic duty of being resistance radio, as the founders originally intended all those many decades, almost an eon now, ago. Follow Netroots Radio on Twitter at Netroots Radio. Thank you, Tom, for taking care of that. I, of course, will take care of and do take care of at Justice Putnam, because who else would? And I post the show notes and links diary on Daily Co's about 10 minutes before showtime for your, well, you know, your linkage pleasure. So go ahead. You can follow the show on Twitter at Cookbook West and pick up podcasts by way of Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeart, YouTube, iTunes, Apple Podcasts. What's a diff? But get them everywhere. They're everywhere. And we're down in the W's. So I think you can just put W in the search and it'll take you there quicker. Don't scroll. Take too long. All right. Let's dive into this first offering here. There's so much more to speak about out there in the world, but let's get into the curated part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy here in the Bistro Cafe. Oh, yes, we are in the front part of the salon. The Speakeasy, of course, is in the back, even beyond the uh, the chef's table. But quite often we bring all the imbibing spirits up front anyway. But regardless, here in the salon, you are in a lovely, well-lit uh, storefront cafe, and uh, there are cookbooks arrayed floor to ceiling on all the walls that don't have windows. Okay. Do you see it? I do. Okay. <laughs> we must always make our place. Emily Singer of uh, the American Independent brings us this first offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Well, fortunately here, after 200 failed congressional attempts to pass an anti-lynching bill, the House finally passed the Emmett Till Anti-Lynching Act. And it overwhelmingly passed the act, a piece of legislation that finally designates uh, lynching a federal hate crime. However, while 410 members of Congress voted for the bill, including every House Democrat in attendance. In attendance? You mean there were some missing votes? Three Republicans. <laughs> and one Republican turned independent voted against the legislation. Re uh, Republican Representative, guess who? Louis Gomez of Texas. Thomas Massey, that little schmuck of Kentucky, and Ted Yoho, you would expect that, of Florida, all voted against the bill, a piece of legislation that Congress has tried and failed to enact nearly 200 times over the last century. 200. Representative Justin Amash of Michigan, oh, you know the guy that was going to save us during the impeachment trial? who left the party and became an independent in 2019 over his opposition to Trump, also voted against it because it's all about states' rights. Another five Republicans had voted against the bill, but 
changed their votes to yays before the vote ended because it might impact them in the election because it already has. Just you wait. Among the GOP lawmakers who changed their vote at the last minute was, oh my God, Representative Steve King, that unreconstructed racist. Well, He's had his committee assignments stripped last year over comments supporting white supremacism. So maybe he's uh, thinking uh, uh, there might be some heat back home, finally. Representative Paul Gosar of Arizona, Chip Roy of Texas, and Andy Biggs of Arizona, Ralph Norman of South Carolina, also voted against the bill before changing their vote to yay. Yoho told CNN that he voted against the bill because he believes it is an overreach of the federal government. An overreach of the federal government. Think about that for a moment. It's an overreach of the federal government to make it a crime. In other words, to confer rights on those who are the victims of potential racial violence. To confer rights on those people to merely live. That is an overreach of federal government. And apparently what is not an overreach is taking the rights away from people so that a racial mob can snuff their lives out in a moment. Anonymous worker bees from the Associated Press bring us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. Lawmakers from both parties told Pentagon leaders that the Defense Department is undermining its own efforts to get military money by diverting billions of dollars for the construction of Donald Trump's U.S.-Mexico vanity border wall. The chairman of the Armed House Armed Services Committee and the committee's top Republican warned Defense Secretary Mark Esper, you know, the toady lobbyist who got installed there to uh, p- procure for the Defense Department. Yeah, that guy. Uh, that overturning congressional funding decisions to shift money for the wall is an enormous problem that will have consequences. The plan to shift money has triggered rare Republican opposition to one of Trump's priorities. Representative Mac Thornberry, a Republican of Texas, unusually, said the result may be that Congress will place greater restrictions on the Pentagon's ability to move money around to meet military needs. Funny, isn't it? A Texan is coming uh, to the defense of uh, the property owners along the border there whose property is being taken away without due compensation, and who cares if it's due or not? The fact is, is that property is king, and apparently some other warlord's coming through and saying, yeah, you think you're the master and king of your own house? Yeah. What do you think this is, America? Well, the uh, chair, Democratic Rep. Adam Smith of Washington said the money transfer is very, very damaging to the Pentagon. The message it sends is the Pentagon has plenty of money, said Smith, adding that it undercuts any arguments for any more need for resources. The Pentagon announced this month that it was slashing billions of dollars in funding for Navy and Air Force aircraft and other military programs to free up money for the construction of the wall. Well, you don't think they charge $800 billion for a nut and a washer just because it's going to go for nuts and washers now, do you? I learned that in, in, in the first Independence Day. No, we learned it a long time ago, even before Waxman. Esper approved the $3.8 billion wall request uh, from the Department of Homeland Security, and the Pentagon acknowledged that more cuts would be coming to provide additional dollars for the wall. We're going through this charade about a wall. Can we just drop this charade about a wall and call it what it is? It's a vanity project. It's not 
to divert money from the Pentagon to the wall. The wall is a piece of you know what. It's badly constructed. It's uh, mostly just repairs on what's already been there. And who knows why it was there to begin with because it was some sort of show. We don't need any money for this wall because this wall should not be built in the first place. And we all know that. of the American Independent brings us this final offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Well, this article about the stones you're uh, clapping back at Trump in an op-ed in the Washington Post uh, makes me wonder if the Washington Post and Seth Cousins are going to be sued by Donald Trump like he's doing similarly to the New York Times for publishing an op-ed there. <laughs> You can sue for an opinion piece now, apparently, for libel. The President of the United States. Who knew? Seth Cousins, one of the jurors in the Roger Stone trial, criticized Donald Trump's public interference in the trial in a Washington Post op ed. Elected officials, now this is uh, Seth Cousins speaking here, have no business attacking citizens for performing their civic duty. When the president attacks our jury's foreperson, he is, effective, he is effectively attacking every American who takes time off work, arranges child care, and otherwise disrupts their life temporarily to participate in this civic duty. Let me jump to the chase. You know, the whole idea about a jury is that you put, oh, well, let me just back up a little bit while I was jumping ahead. First of all, no one goes to a jury without being fully formed in many cases. We can't just have unformed jurors on a jury. They're going to go to the Matrix and pull out some pure, I don't know, unpolluted piece of meat and put them into a decision-making process? It doesn't happen. The idea of a jury is that you put your biases, your well-formed opinions aside... And you look at the evidence and can you decide fair and impartially in spite of what you know out there already? Can you look at this evidence and decide innocence or guilt or to be more precise, guilty or not guilty? And that is the task of a juror. That is our civic duty. Donald Trump has no ability to do that. He can't put aside his biases, bigotries, and prejudices to make an informed decision. And that is evidenced by the fact that he is attacking the jury four person. He's going to be suing this guy, Seth Cousins. He's attacking the judge as he's attacked judges in all of his cases. It's just that when he became president of the United States, it became more, uh, shall we say, publicized. He would attack them for their race. He would attack them for being women. He would attack them for being whatever it was that he deemed were not loyal enough to him because the only ones that can pass judgment on him are the ones who agree with him. And that's what he calls fairness. Donald Trump, Brad Parscale, Dare I say, Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping as well. All of them count on Americans being as stupid as the people that voted for Donald Trump. But America is not. That is the one thing that an un-American personage like Donald Trump has never been able to comprehend. The small, fractious one-third, the toxic one-third that's always been there, that is Trump's base. 
America is not stupid like that. We didn't go to the moon because of the toxic one-third running everything. We're certainly not going to achieve the higher, loftier goal of what the great experiment is expected to achieve. All right. All that said, let's go to our break. And when we get back from that break, we are going to go through weather from around the world and finish up with the stories that we have curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. This is Scientific American 60 Second Science. I'm Suzanne Bard. Thousands of years ago, in what's now the Kimberley region of Western Australia, Aboriginal artists created elaborate rock paintings. Much of the artwork still exists today. If you're walking beside the rivers and creeks and go up into the escarpments, into rock shelters, there are just thousands of rock art sites. University of Melbourne geochronologist Damien Finch. The oldest paintings depict plants and animals. But later works show human figures in ceremonial attire and ornate headdresses. And then around the arms and the elbows and the knees, there's decorations. And sometimes I'll be holding a clutch of boomerangs. And very often they're very finely executed using quite long and elegant looking brushstrokes. The human-centered paintings represent what's known as the Guion style. How old the artwork is has remained a mystery, however. That's because the typical method for estimating the age of ancient objects, radiocarbon dating, relies on the presence of organic carbon. But the artists used ochre pigments that had no organic carbon. There is nothing organic that we can apply carbon dating to. So the only thing that we can do is look for stuff that's either been constructed on top of or underneath the paintings. That's where mud wasps come in. The insects often incorporated organic matter into their nests, which they built on the same rock faces where artists painted. The artists would sometimes paint right on top of old nests. Finch and his colleagues were thus able to date the artwork by sampling the remains of those nests. If it was over the top of the painting, that tells us the painting has to be older than that nest. But if the nest was underneath paint, the painting must be younger than the age that we determined for that nest. And in that way, we can help to build up an idea of when these paintings were created. The analysis revealed that most of the Guion-style paintings sampled were about 12,000 years old. So now we can place that in the context of all the other archaeological and environmental information that we've got for the Kimberley region at that time. The studies in the journal Science Advances. The results provide support for the hypothesis that Aboriginal artists may have switched from painting plants and animals to depicting humans in ceremonial dress around 12,000 years ago in response to the ecological changes and rapidly rising sea levels as the last ice age ended. Finch is now working out the age of other styles of Aboriginal rock art, with a little help from materials that ancient insects once called home. Thanks for listening. For Scientific American 60 Second Science, I'm Suzanne Bard. This program is presented by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. As the days get longer and the weather warms, people of all ages will start to spring into action. Spring is a great time to breathe fresh air, stretch your arms and legs, and get physically active outdoors. Lack of physical activity contributes to obesity, heart disease, stroke, and other chronic health conditions. Fortunately, many communities are making it easier and safer to be physically active. Neighborhoods across the country are working together to create more public spaces for walking, running, biking, and other physical activities. Adults should get at least 150 minutes of physical activity each week, and children should get 60 minutes a day. If you find it hard to walk to a local recreation center, park, or playground, 
Learn how to make your neighborhood a place that makes healthy living easier. Visit makinghealthesier.org for information about ways communities can change to get more people outside and moving. For the most accurate health information, visit www.cdc.gov or call 1-800-CDC-INFO. Sweetie, want some fruit? You have to use the right tool for the job. A power drill is the wrong tool to slice fruit. Just like an antibiotic is the wrong tool to treat viruses, including colds and flu. Antibiotics are only needed for certain bacterial infections. When they aren't needed, antibiotics won't help you, and the side effects could still hurt you. Ask your healthcare professional when an antibiotic is the right tool and when it's not. Visit cdc.gov slash antibiotic dash use. Hi, it's Tom. Could we humbly suggest your donation to netrootsradio.com? All we've got to run this 24-hour powerhouse of progressive resistance radio is what comes out of our own wallets and you. You are our biggest donor. And it doesn't take much, $3, $5. Just go to the bottom of our netrootsradio.com page and hit our secure donate button. Heck, you can even make a recurring contribution, and you'll get a wondiferous pair of Netroots Radio stickers for application to your backpack, your bumper sticker, or your banjo. Well, it's up to you which backpack you want to put it on. So donate what you'd like at the bottom of our netrootsradio.com's homepage. Because you are our biggest donor. NetRootsRadio.com. Together, we are Resistance Radio. October 11th, 2019. United States District Court for the Southern District of New York. I'm Bill Newman, and this is the Civil Liberties Minute. In the case of the city and state of New York, Connecticut, and Vermont versus the Department of Homeland Security, the issue was the new proposed DHS rule on public charge, a rule that said that when a lawful and documented immigrant receives, say, six months of SNAP and Medicaid benefits, which together count as 12 months, within three years, that person could be deported. The new proposed DHS rule was, as the judge found, a drastic deviation from the unambiguous and well-established meaning of the term public charge that has existed in immigration law for over 130 years. It means a person who is likely to become primarily and permanently dependent on the government. The judge ruled, quote, the rule is simply a new agency policy of exclusion in search of a justification. It is repugnant to the American dream of the opportunity for prosperity and success through hard work and upward mobility. Immigrants have always come to this country seeking a better life for themselves and their posterity. With or without help, most succeed. The judge ruled that DHS had no legal authority to rewrite longstanding law. And, quote, plaintiff's motion for issuance of a preliminary injunction is granted. The Civil Liberties Minute is made possible by the ACLU because freedom can't protect itself. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1942. That was the day that 27 Japanese women working in the Seattle public school system handed in their forced resignations. In the aftermath of the attacks on Pearl Harbor, anti-Japanese hysteria swept the United States, especially the West Coast. 127,000 people of Japanese ancestry were sent to live in 10 internment camps by executive order of President Roosevelt. Many of these U.S. citizens sold their homes and businesses, often for a fraction of their value, before they were forced to move. In Seattle, mothers from Gatewood Elementary School circulated a petition for the removal of Japanese office employees from the schools. The school district pressured the women to resign. Even James Sakamoto, the editor of the Japanese American Courier, encouraged the women to voluntarily leave their jobs. He met with the women at the newspaper's office and told them they should resign before they were fired. Faced with such pressure, the women wrote a resignation letter. They wrote, Most of us have received our education in local schools and have been proud of the fact. 
as we have been proud of our positions as employees. Word of the resignations quickly became headline news in local newspapers. Several protests were held in support of the women. Students at the University of Washington circulated a petition on their behalf. They gathered more than a thousand signatures, declaring the treatment of these office workers undemocratic, intolerant, disrespectful of the rights of American citizens. In 1986, the governor of Washington signed into law an admission of wrongdoing toward these women and payment of reparations for their forced resignations. Like what you hear? Check out more at laborhistoryin2.com. This is Solidarity News on Radio Labor. I'm Mark Belongshi. There are currently about 80,000 people in the world affected by the dangerous coronavirus. Almost 3,000 people have died. The virus started in China, but soon began to be found in other places, including a ship that eventually docked in Japan. The Diamond Princess had 3,700 travelers and crew on board when the virus was discovered. As soon as the extent of the crisis was suspected, the union which represents the ship crew began began to help its members. The 1,100 crew members from 40 countries are represented by the Italian union CHISL. CHISL is affiliated to the International Transport Workers Federation. The ITF has 19 million members in 147 countries. To find out more about the situation, I talked to Fabrizio Barcellona, who is in charge of the ITF seafarers section. I asked Mr. Barcellona why the ITF became involved with the situation on the Diamond Prince. Because the ship, like many other in the cruise industry, are covered by an agreement signed by ITF affiliated union and the industrial relation between the union and the company. Uh, after signing agreement, continue to uh, make sure that there is that level of protection and discussion with the company to ensure that the seafarers we enjoy the term and condition of the grip that has been signed. So uh, when the situation occurs, it is not the only ship where a situation uh, like this occurs. The Union immediately activated their channel to get in touch with the company to ensure that the crew is looked after. How did the crew react when the virus was found on board? As the seafarers are resilient people, they, they are used to crisis, if it can be a small crisis, a big crisis, uh, I think they react uh, uh, incredibly uh, well and they were you know, assisting the company on board of the vessel to ensure that the, guests, the passengers on board were uh, looked after. There have been some uh, in a situation where some of the citizens uh, raised the question whether the company should have put more effort on the uh, citizens' uh, welfare as they did for the passenger, but that was uh, clarified. And, uh, uh, of course, from the position of the government of Japan, there were no passenger or seafarers. They were uh, a potential victim of the contagion, and so that they tried to contain that contagion. And so I, I think that that uh, is something that the company... I don't know if they could have done something before. Certainly when they were... Uh, in the middle of a crisis, they activate themselves to do something for both passengers and the seafarers. How did the ITF help the seafarers? In, in many ways. Um, in general, we do many things, but this particular instance, uh, we have a, a system of uh, shop steward on board. Uh, the seafarers uh, learn a, a, a number of uh, subjects. Uh, and they share their experience, they, they are uh, given information about the Maritime Legal Convention, which is the, uh, the newest uh, international regulation to protect seafarers. Uh, uh, they go through uh, discrimination, bullying, and harassment policies, uh, how to, uh, what are the role and responsibility, the contractual terms, and, uh, and how the contractual terms apply to the seafarers. And, uh, and obviously, it, this is one of those situations that um, we find difficult to deal with because there is a something that occurs out of the blue 
and it's not necessarily a contractual term that you have a time to prepare, so you have to react as it happens. 70 members of the crew on the Diamond Princess were affected with the virus. And that's it. International labor news you can use. You can find our features and daily newscasts on our website at www.radiolabor.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Labor. I'm Mark Belanger. Thank you for listening. And remember, it's all about global solidarity. Thank you for accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays, a little bit of jambalaya, a little bit of spice in your life. We always begin weather from around the world along the banks of the Rogue River and the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently 29 degrees Fahrenheit here at the mothership. We are expecting abundant sunshine, a high bumping 70. Oh my, winds are continuing to be light and variable. Overnight lows uh, will continue to be in the mid-30s. They say that may uh, tick up a bit warmer, but I doubt it. Mid-30s is about where it will be. A few passing clouds overnight, partly cloudy skies tomorrow with highs in the mid-60s. Winds will be shifting out of the southwest at 5 to 10 miles per hour, so... We have something to look forward to tomorrow, then, don't we? Okay, uh, pollen is still rated at none. The air quality index is good at 22 parts per million. And the daytime UV index is moderate at 3. Barometric pressure is rising at 30.4 inches. Visibility is at 6 miles. And relative humidity is 92%. Weather from around the world is brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchased. These people planted these purchased personal weather stations somewhere on their property. And these people positively live around the world. London is 46 and partly cloudy. Paris is 45 and with cloudy and a lot of wind. With clouds and a lot of wind. That's how it should be. Rome is 55 and sunny. Kiev is 40 and cloudy. Kabul is 52 and cloudy. Hong Kong is 64 and cloudy. Tokyo is 39 degrees and clear. Sydney, Australia is 68 degrees and clear. San Francisco, California is 53 and fair. And New York, New York is 40 degrees Fahrenheit and cloudy. And that is weather from around the world, brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchased. These people planted these purchased personal weather stations somewhere on their property, and these people positively live around the world. Anonymous worker bees out of Reuters bring us this first amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Killings of women engaged in community organizing and defending human rights in Colombia increased nearly 50% in 2019 compared to the year before, the UN said yesterday Wednesday as it urged the government to redouble protection efforts. Violence against so-called social leaders has become a top issue for the government of President Ivan Duque. Or is that Duque? 
who has faced frequent criticism from the international community, non-governmental organizations, and human rights activists for not doing enough to stop the killings. Last year, 108 human rights defenders of all genders were killed, the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights told journalists, while a further 10 cases were still being verified. 108 plus 10. 15 of the activists murdered were women. We are alarmed that in 2019, the killings of women human rights defenders increased close to 50%, Alberto Brunori, the human rights uh, chief in Colombia, said. The quick and effective implementation of a comprehensive program of guarantees for women leaders and women human rights defenders could be an important tool for prevention and protection against murders and attacks, he added. The number of activist killings has fallen overall since Duque took office in August of 2018, the center-right president told journalists at a breakfast event on on Wednesday yesterday. There is a reduction, but the figure should be zero, said Duque. He blamed the killings on Marxist-led National Liberation Army rebels, dissidents from the FARC rebel movement who reject a 2016 peace deal, and criminal gangs involved in drug trafficking and illegal mining. There were 36 massacres defined as the killing of more than four people in Colombia last year, the highest figure in the last five years, the UN Rights Office said. Fifteen people died in police or army operations involving presumed arbitrary detentions, and a total of 115 activists were killed in Colombia in 2018. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles, rester toujours fidèle C'est tout, c'est tout Je te donne tous mes printemps, mes étés de mer Mais autant quand les feuilles tombent partout Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire Je te donne tous mes hivers The ever amorphous anonymous worker bees at Reuters bring us this final amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. The disgraced former leader of Austria's far-right Freedom Party, the FPO, Heinz Christian Strasch, said yesterday, Wednesday, he is running for office with a splinter group, a, fle- a fresh blow to the FPO after Strasch was ensnared in a string that forced it out of government. I think it was in a, a string of uh, illegal activities is that what they forgot to put in that sentence. The FPO expelled Strasch in December after its support collapsed in September's parliamentary election over scandals including the video sting in which Strasch offered to fix government contracts at a dinner party in Ibiza with a woman posing as a Russian oligarch's niece. Oh, my, my, my. Sounds like a honeypot to me. Strasch, who led the FPO for 14 years, has apologized for the massive mistake. It was a youthful indiscretion, you know. That led conservative Chancellor Sebastian Kurtz to end his coalition with the FPO in May. Kurtz is now back in government, this time with the Greens. The horror. The horror. Prosecutors are investigating Strasch on su- suspicion of fraud in connection with the sting footage. He denies committing any crimes. Strasch said he plans to run as the lead candidate in Vienna's provincial election this autumn for the Alliance of Austria, the DAO, which was founded in December as a group within Vienna's regional assembly by Strasch loyalists with FPO seats. Wow. What a maneuver. This means he is also running for mayor in Red Vienna. 
a bastion of the social Democrats who have led the city and province for decades. When he led the FPO in the Vienna elections in 2015, his party came in second with roughly 31% to the SPO's 40. While Strasser's image has been tarnished by the video sting, he remains popular with many core FPO voters because, hey, a fascist is a fascist, as long as it can make the, I don't know, the honeypots run on time, all okay with them. All right, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day. But you do know Netroots Radio will broadcast on, and we will meet up tomorrow for Blue Moon Spirits Fridays, and don't we deserve it. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks, and we'll meet up here tomorrow. Right here in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Je voudrais du soleil vert. Tell it detail Des photos de bord de mer Demain jardin d'hiver Je voudrais de la lumière Comme en nouvelle Angleterre Je veux changer d'atmosphère Demain jardin d'hiver Je voudrais du frais d'Astère Revoir un latte coël Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver